Alright, so, um, yeah, this is gonna be an, an, an interesting, uh, blind let's play here. Um, as a lot of people know, there's this whole blow-up about, uh, the creator of this game, Depression Quest, uh, Zoe Quinn. Uh, at least, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> um, things and stuff, and, and I'm not really gonna go into it. But, the point is, you know, you know, she made this game, and it just recently came out on Steam. It's it's for free if you want to go grab it. Um, but I've got it set up to where I can use the mouse, or I can use my controller. Um, either way it works. Um, you can't see my cursor, unfortunately, because I did not have the foresight to set it up before I started recording. So, this is Depression Quest, and I couldn't get a good shot of the title screen, because when the title screen came up, uh, Fraps was like, nope, nope, nope. But now we're here, and Fraps is fine, so... So anyway, this is kind of a, a thing. I'll go at least, you know, 30 minutes, or until I, I guess, win, if it's not that big. Um, so yeah. Uh, so let's, let's see what we got here. Um, it's, it is early on a Monday morning. You're a mid-twenties human being. You have a significant, a significant other, rather, named Alex, who you're rather fond of. That you have been seeing exclusively for the past few months. Okay. The rest of your social circle consists of a variety of friends and acquaintances, some of whom you met at, a day, at your day job, which is a little boring, but pays the rent. You'd like to be doing more with your life, as would your parents, but you're still in the process of figuring out what that means and how to go about it. You're also dealing with motivation issues that sometimes makes dealing with these things difficult. Uh, you'll feel like this is probably your fault, and on bad days you can feel awkward, inwardly angry, rather. Awkwardly angry would be an interesting one, but no, it's inwardly. And down on yourself for being lazy, but you're not quite sure how you can break out of it, or how other people deal with these feelings that seem so very functional. You spend a lot of nights fixating on thinking about this, but never seem to do anything about it, other than lose sleep. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah, pardon me, I'm, I'm still dealing with I'm dealing with like stuffed nose and shit. I don't know why. It is un it is an unseasonably warm Wednesday evening. Oh, my nightmares. Yeah, you spent several the past several hours at work. The past week or so, you found your job motivation flagging more so than usual. You've been in a fog practically all day, simply going through the motions without realizing even what you've been doing half the time. And yet, you seem to be moving at half speed. You're so checked out that when your boss approaches you to tell you that it's dead and you go home early, it barely registers. I've had days like that. Uh, as you walk home, the streets hiss from the recent rainfall. You know that your significant other will be in classes until late, another couple of hours at least. You briefly consider using the serendipitous solitude to catch up on that project you've been working on haphazardly for the past few months. Oh dear, little eye. As soon as you think about the work that awaits you at home, you can feel the panic creeping in from the back of your brain, unbidden. All you can think about is how incredibly far behind you are, and the amount of work seems nothing less than insurmountable. By the time you arrive home and change out of your uncomfortable work clothes, the stress is weighing down on you like a heavy, wet wool blanket. Your computer seems to be staring at you down, staring you down from your desk. I can read, I swear. You want to sit down and work, but the mere thought of trying to work sends your stress levels flying. More than anything, you feel suddenly and absolutely exhausted, and you feel a strong, de feel a strong desire to simply hide in bed. So let's see. Alright, so we have some choices here. Um, do you order some food, grab a drink, and hope down for a night of work? And notice I can't drink, I can't choose that. Uh, they have these down here. Your depressed interaction is exhausting and more you become you're becoming more and more withdrawn. You're currently you're not currently seeing a therapist. You're not currently taking medication for depression. This is important to know. Um a role-playing game in the, in the purest sense, <laughs> I guess. Um, let's see. Let's see. You have reluctantly sit down at your desk to try and make yourself do something. Turn on the TV telling yourself you just need a quick half hour to unwind. Crawl into bed. You're so stressed and overwhelmed you couldn't possibly, possibly accomplish anything anyways. Um, let's see. If it were me, I, I would probably, probably end up doing that in the end, or at least something similar. Oh, hi, Netflix. Just a half hour on TV, you tell yourself, as, as absently grasping for the remote. You don't, you don't so much sit down on the couch as sink into it. 
turn on the TV and start going through your usual channel routine. After a few cycles of this, and you realize you're really not doing much more than thumb calisthenic, calisthenics whoop, and absently killing time. You check the clock and see that over 20 minutes have already passed since you sat down. As your self-imposed time limit creeps ever nearer, you become more and more anxious. You stand up and walk to the fridge, telling yourself, just make a quick sandwich and get to work right after that. Can't be productive on an empty stomach, right? Well, actually, technically you can, but, but of course there is the whole overlying thing is people, yeah. There is a point to this, and, and I, I try, I'm going to try and keep my snark a little lighter. Start pacing around your apartment, heading past your bedroom in the process. I'm sorry, as you eat, you start pacing around your apartment, heading past your bedroom in the process. Stop in the doorway as if physically unable to cross the threshold. Familiar waves of exhaustion start racking you, and you feel simultaneously, simultaneously rather tired and panicked. You close your door and head back to the couch. It's still early yet, you tell yourself. As long as I get to work in an hour, I'll have plenty of time to be productive. As you flip channels and let the sea of Science Jeopardy reruns wash over you using deeper into the couch, feeling at once enroached upon and shielded by being quite literally swallowed up by it. As the second hour draws nearer, sure enough, you find yourself getting anxious and jittery. You repeat the fridge, paste, couch process a couple more times before you look at the clock and realize that several hours have passed and not surprisingly, you've managed to get no work done. As you crawl into bed, acutely aware of the fact that you have work in the morning and that any opportunity you had to catch up on your own creative endeavors today was squandered. You're feeling so disgusted with yourself that when Alex calls to talk to you on her way home from class, you simply say you had a really rough day at work and you're trying to rest up before your shift tomorrow. She says she understands and wishes you a good night, though you can't help but notice she sounds slightly disappointed. Ironically, the stress of potentially upsetting your partner compounds with the stress of not having gotten anything done this evening and the stress of having to go into work tomorrow. The buzzing of anxiety in your brain melts together with your body's utter physical exhaustion and you sink into a semi-hypnagogic, hypnagogic, somebody will correct me, anxious funk. Too tired to try and work, but too anxious to fall asleep for several hours. And they remind you here, you are very depressed, spend a large time, amount of time sleeping and hating yourself, and have very little energy or motivation. You're not seeing a therapist, not taking medication. Okay. It's a mild Friday afternoon. Yeah, time skip here. Alex calls you from one of her classes, telling you that there's going to be a really awesome birthday party tonight at her apartment that one of her roommates is throwing. Oh, kick ass. You've hung out with this roommate a few times with Alex, and you get along well enough, but aren't particularly close. You don't have work in the morning, and have nothing else in particular to do tonight. You're feeling kind of run down, but you've been fatigued most of the time lately. You mentioned that you're feeling ill because you're not sure how else to explain those feelings to someone else, and say that you aren't sure that you can make it tonight. There's a second of silence over your phone, but you can swear you can hear the sound of your partner's face fall. She tries to convince you anyway, you haven't seen her this week, and she sounds pretty insistent that you come over. She even drops a few suggestively worded hints that you can stay over with them tonight after the party. Blah, blah, blah. What do you do? And of course, we get, we get the choices again, still, you know, same things before. Um, the first one, of course, is not available, which I think is kind of the point. Um, let's see. Honestly, I have at this point, if I hadn't seen her in a whole week, you know, or, or most part of a week, I would agree to go. You know, I, I may not have the best time, but I would get to see her. I hear people. <laughs> and it's not because of people on my end. Okay. You agree to go, even though you're not really feeling social. You know it's important to Alex, and you'd really like to see her. Seeing her does make you feel better sometimes, and you hope that this is the case tonight, even if it does mean dealing with all the usual social anxiety. The time to leave rolls around and you grab your overnight bag. Alex's apartment is a short walk away and there are already people hanging out on the porch. You feel your chest tighten as you approach the building and try to steal your nerves. You quickly find your partner chatting away with a birthday girl and Alex immediately lights, lights up when she sees you. I'm so happy you came! I wasn't sure if you were going to make it! A young man taps on her shoulder and she turns back to you, turns back to, you to apologize and to let you know they have something to do. They have to do something for the party. I, I, I read good, I swear. Alex hands you a beer and plants a kiss on your cheek before going up to deal with whatever came up. As you look around, you don't see anyone else you recognize. 
And again, of course, the first one is not an option because, again, you're very depressed, you don't, you're not seeing a therapist, you're not seeing medication. Again, that's the point they're trying to get across here. Um, apologies, I had to take a sip of a drink. Uh, so here are our choices. Stay, stand in the same spot. Uh, put your bag in Alex's room and avoid the crowd in there for a while. Cling to, cling to the back wall, sip your beer, wait for your girlfriend. Proceed to drink in earnest, hoping it makes you less uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, so you could be awkward, you could hide, you could hide in the crowd, or you could get drunk. Um, <laughs> um, and, and, and I chuckle at this, but, but it's all serious stuff. It, it really is. Um, let's see if I was me there. I would probably start out with three, but then end up going to four. So, I, I would go to four. Because four is where I would end up. As Alex leaves, you are not quite sure what to do with yourself. Standing in the middle of the room leaves you feeling kind of exposed, and you don't feel ballsy enough to randomly approach any of the groups of people, groups of people clustered together talking. You head to a clear spot on the back wall and lean against it. For some reason, this always feels a lot more secure. You can scan, you scan the party for a familiar face or any sign of your partner and come up with nothing. Not sure what else to do and worrying that you must look creepy just standing there watching everyone, you take out your phone and you take out your phone to busy yourself. Twenty semi semi tedious games of a jewel blitz later, hey, that's a pretty fun game. Your partner returns. You spend the rest of the night with Alex, occasionally being introduced to people and nodding and along with group conversations, even if you don't participate that much. At the end of the night, as you're falling asleep with your girlfriend in the crook of your arm, she thanks you again for coming. Half drunk, she finds that she thought you were going to flake out and was pleasantly surprised that you managed to come out. She says it lovingly, but you're not quite sure how to feel about that statement. Again, reminder, very impressed, not seeing a therapist, not taking medication. I hope there are options to change all of that. I really do. afternoon on a muggy Saturday. Uh, Saturday wants my money. Your mother has come over for a surprise visit, claiming loudly that she doesn't see you enough, and so she divided, decided to invite herself over. Fucking rude. As you converse, she walks around your place and you get the distinct impression you're being inspected. So what's going on with you lately, she asks, she asks abruptly. Taken somewhat aback by this left fielder, you tell her that you're not sure what she means. She repeats the question, saying that you haven't seemed like yourself lately. She gestures to the dirty dishes piled in the sink and notes the fact that you haven't called or visited in a while. Your ret reticent reticence? I think that's how it is. Again, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Only seems to spur her on more. She presses you, asking if you're having problems at work or with Alex, and you're beginning to feel increasingly battered by her sudden well-meaning but overwhelming inquisition. Under her questions, you become increasingly uncomfortable. You want to be able to explain to her how you've been feeling, but the truth is you're not really sure of yourself. Nothing horrific has happened at work or with your significant other or friends or anything like that. But all the same, you can't deny that lately you've just felt drained and as though you're not really here. You wish you could tell your mother these things, but she hasn't been approachable about negative emotions in the past. She is the kind of person who holds the opinion that the solution to any problem is to simply try harder and maintain a positive attitude, a stance that has reared its head in the past conversations when you've begun to explore the subject with her. You know she's unlikely to be understanding, and you feel the energy drained out of you when you imagine what would happen if you managed to blurt out everything that you were feeling. What do you do? Okay, of course, the first one is not an option. Um, I, I guess... I know some people, and I admit, I, I admit, I think it a little bit myself that, um, you know, with the first option not being there and not being available is a little bit of a, of an annoyance. But I think that's what she's trying to get across: is that, yeah, of course, you know, you want to, you want to be able to, but it's just not an option mentally. There is a mental block on that option. So, so I, I think that's what they're going for. These choices are try to be honest with her anyway. Tell her everything is fine. Thanks for asking. Change the subject. Uh, you know what? At least two. At least two is an option, and it closes one to one, which is what I would want to do. So let's see. You attempt to tell your mother how you're feeling, despite initial misgivings that you, you have about doing so. Finding the right words for how you're feeling feels like 
trying to untangle Christmas lights, searching for the dead bulb in the cluttered mess. Uh, she watches you intently and audibly sighs before you can clearly articulate anything. Unfortunately, she rejects predictably. An attitude like that won't get you anywhere. You need to work harder at getting what you want instead of sitting around feeling sad about it. Nothing good will happen unless you make it happen. Which, while that can't be true, there's things in the brain that are not allowing it to happen. She isn't angry or spiteful as she tells you this. You try to explain that it's not a matter of that, but you can tell that you're not getting anywhere. The frustration chokes the words in your throat, and you give up on trying to push the subject further. You know she's giving you the advice that makes sense to her and genuinely wants the best for you. However, she doesn't understand that it's not as simple as somehow deciding to be positive or work harder. It's that those things aren't viable options because of these feelings. You accept defeat and the conversation drifts onto other subjects. She leaves after chiding you to call her more often and try and take better care of yourself. You sigh heavily and close the door behind her, spend the next few hours laying in bed, staring at the ceiling. I think there was supposed to be an and in there. Um, yeah, just saying. But that's a minor thing. It's a minor nitpick. It's a lazy Sunday morning. Easy like Sunday morning. Okay. I've got to have some levity in here somewhere. As if not, then, well, this could be the most depressive depressing let's play I've, I'll have ever produced. Um, okay. Uh, you are idly clicking around online as your phone rings. Sam, a co-worker of yours that you're friendly with, asks how you are and makes hurried small talk with you. You typically only ever talk to him on the phone when one of you needs a shift covered, so it's slightly awkward. You're waiting in anticipation for him to ask you to come in on short notice when he veers the conversation in a completely different direction. How do you feel about cats, he asks. I had kittens a few weeks ago, and I'm having an awfully hard time finding a home for the last one of the litter. You don't have any pets, right? Kitty! I want kitty. I want kitty. Takes you a moment to process this new information, and you're caught off guard as he begins to earnestly try to sell you on the idea of taking the last kitten off his hands. I want... It's not something that you had specifically considered before, and he seems fairly insistent. She's a real sweetheart, really loves people. She's got all her shots already taken care of, and the vet says she's as healthy as she's healthy as a horse. I'll bring her over by your place tonight if you're interested. You look around your apartment, try to picture a cat in it, as he continues to tell you about how cute she is. You tell him that this is all kind of sudden, and that you don't have anything for the kitten set up here. Oh, don't worry about that. I can bring over a litter box and food, and all that, since you'd really be helping me out of a fix. It's the least I could do. I just don't want to have to put her in a shelter. You can't help but feel like you're being guilt-tripped, but yeah, and you just, but you decide to give it some serious consideration. It does get awfully lonely around your apartment, it might feel less empty with a cat around. However, since you've been feeling so down, it might not be a good idea to take on the responsibility of a cat, even if they are fairly low maintenance. What do you do? Oh dear. So this time the first two are, uh, are up there. Take the cat, knowing full well you can take good care of it, decline, so you can't do that, um, yeah. Let's see. Um, oh God. And this is this is a tough one because on the one hand, you know the, the the third one you know may not be in a good enough place because you could accidentally do the wrong thing and kill the kitty, and we don't want to kill the kitty. But at the same time, the kitty might help with the depression and the companionship. You know, you know, kitty might be there. You'll have the kitty there, and he'll just hop up on the desk and meow and purr and be like, "Yee, kitty." You know, the kitty will remind you to feed it, and, and and the smell will remind you to do the thing. But then again, you're also under all these things here at the bottom. Um, ah, that's a tough one. <laughs> ah, um, I'm gonna go. You know what? I I'm I'm gonna go with four on this one. I'm sorry, I just can't right now. I hope you find a good home for her. You sit through a few more sales pitch statements on that border, that border on guilt trips and rebut them with fabricated excuses about your landlord not allowing pets before your co-worker gives up and thanks you anyway. You wish him luck in finding a home for her, and as you hang up, you feel pangs of guilt as you imagine having to put her in a shelter. You wonder if the chance of the kitten ending up in a shelter was worse than the chance of you being able to uncare, unable to care for an animal. You feel pretty awful about yourself regardless. Yeah, that's true. Apartment's emptiness feels a lot more palpable suddenly, and you wonder if you could have pulled it off. You consider getting a pet in the future after more careful consideration and preparation. Okay, so that's good. Next day at work, you run into your coworker and breathe a sigh of relief as he informs you that he was able to find a good home for the kitten. She's probably way better off than she would be with me, you think. And of course, a reminder. Uh, 
uh, it's late Friday afternoon and quitting time is just around the corner. Hooray! Bright clear day is giving you, uh, giving way to a still temperate evening. You can hear your co-workers all around you anxious, anxiously making plans for their evenings and weekends, but you're really looking forward to just going home and resting after what's turned out to be a very long and taxing work week. Just before the end of your shift, you get a call from Alex. It seems a group of your mutual friends are heading out to a nearby pub and drinks to celebrate the end of the week. And they want to know if you'd like to come along. You tentatively tell her that you're emotionally exhausted from the work week and a social outing like that would just take too much out of you today. You encourage her to go and have a good time since you know it's been a while since she's gone out with friends. But the effort feels, feels futile since you know that she isn't going to go without you. A couple of hours later, you, the two of you find yourselves in a familiar position. On the couch, watching comedy shows on Netflix, a box of pizza open on the coffee table in front of you. As you look across the couch at her, you start to feel anxious. Oh god, that, that first paragraph, that sounds way too familiar, except not so much the snuggling. Uh, you feel bad about effectively forcing the two of you to stay in tonight again. While you are always appreciative of your partner's efforts to take your feelings into account and help make sure you're socially comfortable, you sincerely worry that you're holding her back from enjoying a more fulfilling relationship. While she does seem to enjoy spending time with you, as the two of you sit in, com sit in comfortable, almost con contented silence, watching old shows that you've, been, that you've seen two or three times before, your ever-increasing fear that your relationship is becoming one-sided weighs more and more heavily on you. You feel more than, more than ever like a burden or a word to her, and it's virtually impossible for you to see what value you could have you could possibly offer to her in return. Worst of all, this nagging fear has made you feel more self-conscious than ever. With trying ever inwards, and you've started to pull away from even, even from Alex herself. What do you do? And this time, oh shit! Only four options. Half of them are are gone. Um, yeah, the first one is you know, despite bad times, your girlfriend sincerely loves you. Yeah, that and that actually would probably be close to my uh, my thing. And two would, would be that there. Um, out of all those, it would be a risk, but but I would honestly ask if she is happy, honestly, because I would want to know, depression or not. You know, I don't care how much it would destroy me. I would rather know. I would rather know for sure. At Alex, who hasn't noticed you watching her yet, and you try to parse the expression on her face. You worry that it's one of sheer boredom and bare tolerance. You wonder if she's thinking about all the fun things she could have been doing tonight if she wasn't trapped on this couch with you, ordering from one of the same three takeout places you always order from. A sense of disappointing her creeps over you as you picture what the night could have been if you had just accepted the invitation she had made earlier. I know this is pretty boring for a Friday. I know this is a pretty boring Friday night for you. Are you really happy being with me, being like this? She turns to look at you, her forehead wrinkled. Why do you ask me that so often? You feel her body stiffen and pull away from yours just a little. Well, I mean, you start, but you are unable to think of how to answer. Uh, okay, of course, first two, probably silly, but it's reassuring. We're on the same page. I'll make sure I'm right for you. Uh, um, I think the closest one of these would be this one. So Alex sighs. Look, if that were the case, I would let you know. I don't think you're boring. You're more of a homebody than I am. I'm learning how to deal with that. Deal with it, you think? Repeating it in your mind? Does she see it was a problem to be dealt with? You try to pick her reply apart in your mind, and all of your conclusions lead to your previous worry, that you're holding her back. You begin thinking that the phrasing was chosen without too much deliberation, and that despite her attempts at reassuring you, the slip of the tongue revealed her true feelings. As you picture how much fun she would be having right now if you would only accepted her invitation and managed to somehow get over your reservations and anxieties, despite not knowing how you would go about that, she cuddles back up to you. Thanks for putting up with me, you say, staring at the TV without actually watching it. She sighs in response. Oh dear. Well, if you weren't depressed before. Oh jeebus. Uh, it's a breezy, breezy Sunday afternoon. You've allowed Amanda, an old friend from school that is in town for the weekend to talk to you into leaving the house for coffee and catch up. You meet her in a small cafe and talk about what you've been up to since you've last seen each other. And you can't help but feel like they are, they are a lot more accomplished and interesting than you are while listening to them talk about their life after school. Ain't that the truth? When it's your turn to breathe.
debrief them on your activities, you feel anxious and ashamed and give a very abbreviated version. You try to talk about your job as little as possible, and you feel incredibly boring while you describe it despite her expressing sincere interest in you and your life. Amanda has known you long enough to read your mood and tone of voice. She leans in to ask a question while gently touching your hand, a look of genuine concern on her face. What's wrong? Well, you could either, well, suggesting change of location and confide her honestly, testing the waters open up a little, those are not there. Because again, you're deeply depressed. Even activities you, that you used to enjoy hold little or no interest for you and exist in a near constant state of lethargy. Lethargy? Lethargy? Whatever. Again, correct me. Uh, let's see, it says nothing's wrong. Um, all of that. Uh, I would just notice. Okay, it's such a small question, but it feels like a blow to the gut. You surprise yourself when you realize that your tightly clenched fists are now beginning to shake slightly. Despite your best efforts, you feel tears begin to sting at your eyes. You try to disguise this by tilting your head up and praying they'll they'll suck back in. She su suggests that you two get out of there and you feel mortified. She offers to go back to your apartment with you, but the two of you end up talking in her car for two hours as words just pour forth from you. Amanda seems unsure of what to say at times, but she listens and rubs your back and sobs as you talk. She asks if you've ever if you've gone to a doctor about this, and you admit you haven't. She mentions that her mother is seeing a very good therapist in town and offers to ask her about it. You're not thrilled about the idea of going to a therapist, even less thrilled that Amanda might be telling someone about your problems. But she persists and tells you she'll email you the doctor's contact information later in the week. Okay, this is good. It is a glaringly sunny Monday. I like the word glaringly sunny. I like that phrase. And one of the few days that your brother Malcolm is in town and free long enough for you two to actually see each other. You have a dental appointment that day, but you make plans for him to pick you up afterward. Your appointment takes a little longer than expected because your dentist tells you that you've started grinding your teeth in your sleep and to a worrying degree. Ah, that explains some of the headaches I get at night. Um, given how nearly everything in your life has been feeling enormous and stressful lately, this doesn't come as a surprise to you. He suggests that you try to reduce your stress levels and fits you for a night guard. It feels awkward and too big for your mouth, and you feel embarrassed looking at your puffed, fa puffed out face in the mirror with it in. You finish up the appointment in a hurry and leave about half an hour overdue for your meeting with your always punctual brother in the parking lot. You finish up as quickly as possible and leave the building to scan the parking lot for your brother's car, but you don't see his old Civic anywhere. Class, you pass by a blue Camaro and jump as it beeps at you, causing you to jump in surprise. It takes you a moment for you. To, it takes you a moment for to realize it. I think it's for you to realize it. You kind of missed a word there. Again, nitpicking. But it's Malcolm in the driver's seat. You hop in the passenger seat and compliment him on his new ride, and it mentions it's a, that it's a perk of the promotion he's recently obtained at work. He starts telling you about how much more money he's making, how his career is really taking off, and how he's starting to look at houses with his wife soon. Oh, dear. You clutch the bag containing the night guard in your hand and feel yourself clench your teeth as you think of your crummy apartment and how long it's been since you've been able to take a day off work without having to worry about making ends meet. He's only two years older than you, but he feels like he's eons ahead of you in every other aspect of your lives. So, he asks, how did your appointment go? Did you get drilled full of holes or what? A sense of shame creeps over you. Uh, uh, you can't laugh about the dorky night guard and you can't tell him why you need it. Um, out of these two, I, I would say that one. The dentist said I'm apparently grinding my teeth too much when I sleep. Oh, he replies, been stressed out lately, kiddo? Deciding that you really don't really want to go into it, you tell him that you don't think it's the case and it's probably just a random thing. He doesn't pry farther and instead begins reminiscing with you about the time you chipped a baby tooth because he accidentally knocked you over once. <laughs> uh, you go out for dinner and catch up on things, but you feel, still feel somewhat distracted by the gnawing anxiety in the back of your mind. Though you enjoy your brother's company, you still feel like you want to become no you want nothing more than to go home and hide from the world tonight. It becomes hard for you to try to stuff all the horrible feelings down and go emotionless someone like the dentist can see a fraction of what goes on inside your head. It leave, excuse me, it leaves you feeling embarrassed and weak, and you hate yourself for feeling that way. You wonder if you're really fooling anyone into thinking you're a normal person. And then you wonder if your brother knows and is hanging out with you out of pity tonight. After he drops you back off to your apartment, you throw the night guard out. You can't even stand to look at the thing. Aww. And I know my, 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 uh, my logical brain is like, really? Really? Don't do the no. But I also know that, you know, yeah, depression is not logical. I understand that. Okay. 
and it's a dry Sunday morning. You grab your morning coffee and sit down to your desk to check your email. A new message pops up in your inbox almost as soon as you do. It's from Amanda, and you remember her, your meeting in the cafe and awkwardly bringing up your feelings to her. Uh, subject, hey buddy. Hey, sorry it's been a few weeks. I meant to get this to you sooner, but it took a while for me to get a hold of my folks back home. Dad told me to say hi, by the way. Anyway, I remembered what we talked about last time I saw you, and I hope you aren't insulted. But I asked my mom for the number for her therapist. Don't worry, I didn't tell her who it was for. I think she's worried about me now, though. <laughs> anyway, the number is... number. It's a really good office. You should look into it. Talking to someone never hurts. If you're worried about money, don't be. They're one of the few that has a really good sliding scale fee system and won't charge you what you can't afford. I hope you're feeling better. It was really nice to see you again. It's still early enough that you can call and make an appointment today. What do you do? Uh, let's see. Call number is not an option. Try your luck. Call the number is not an option. Um, let's see. I would go with three. The thought of picking up the phone and calling someone about this right now is overwhelming. Sure, you're having a hard time lately and have motivation issues, but are you really in need of therapy? Shouldn't you be able to just get over it, go over it yourself? What if they put you on medication that makes you feel like a zombie? What if you go and the therapist looks down on you? What will Alex think about this? Trying to think about all these things at once makes it feel like a very big deal and you decide to take your time to think on it. The rest of the day passes quickly, and that night you have a hard time trying to sleep because your brain is too busy thinking about all these things and imagining all the ways it could go horribly wrong. The next morning you check your email again with blurry eyes. Amanda's email is still there, seemingly waiting for you. You are more no, no more decided than what you were yesterday. What now? Uh, we can call after wrestling or don't call. Uh, I'm gonna call. You read through Amanda's email two or three more times, then sit there at your computer for a while. While the memory of that uncomfortable conversation makes you feel newly embarrassed and self-conscious, part of you is also encouraged by the fact that she cared enough to get back to you at all. Sitting in front of your computer, you start to question things like whether or not Amanda sent you this number out of pity, or perhaps some sense of obligation after having listened to you. You question her motives and the validity, validity of her concern, whether or not you think seeing a therapist would be, even be helpful. Yet, almost unconsciously, you reach for your phone, and before you realize what's happening, you're listening to the therapist's line ring. Before you can bring yourself to hang up, you're listening to the slightly clinical but not unpleasant voice of the receptionist ask how she can help you. Uh, I, I'd like to make an appointment with the, the doctor. You manage to stammer out. The conversation is quick and not nearly as unpleasant as you were fearing. And, the quick, and quicker than you can say Freudian slip, you've scheduled an appointment. Quicker than you realize, appointment day rolls around. What do you do? Okay, we are getting close to the end of the time, um, but I do want to go through this this thing here. Um, still at those three, yeah. Um, da, 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 I would go, so I'm gonna go. Um, yeah, there's only a next here, so we'll we'll end at the end of this page. You have your first session with your new therapist, Dr. Susan Melville. A tall woman in her mid-forties with a disarming demeanor and patient eyes with the start of the slightest smile lines. She makes you feel comfortable fairly easy, which is a pleasant surprise after all your anxiety over the appointment. As you leave, you make a second appointment. You're still skeptical about all of this, but, but figure you might as well see where this goes. The hardest part, it seems, was taking the first step. You're still not sure how, if and how you're going to tell your family or your partner, but you figure you'll deal with that when the time comes. Either way, you feel relieved that you've managed to see this through instead of being paralyzed with worry over it. Even if nothing comes of it, you did something you said you would, you said you would instead of flaking out or running away. You're emotionally exhausted when you get home and collapse into bed. You sleep better the night than you have in a week, and you're not sure if it's because you were so tired when you got home or if it's because of the therapist. Okay, so we leave it. We leave it here. Um, I let's say we leave it with you're very depressed, been a large time. Yeah, you've spent some time on a therapist's couch. You're having difficulty finding the motivation to continue going to your sessions. Not currently taking medication. So this second one is an improvement, a little bit. So, so that's where we're at. That's where we're gonna leave it because I said about 30 minutes or so. Um, but uh, again, it's free on Steam if you want to check it out. Um, so far, I, I'm finding it you know, not bad. It's a lot of text-heavy, so if you're not into like text-heavy text games or whatever, then go ahead. And, and, you know, obviously you're not going to be into it. But but if you know if you you might be dealing with depression, you know, keep in mind uh, there are this that, that that was the warning at the beginning. 
um, that stated, yeah, you know, you, you know, this, this could be a trigger thing, possibly, you never know, um, so, yeah, very heavy, I tried, I, obviously, you heard me try to lighten it up a little bit, um, but, yeah, I just wanted to get this out there, and I wanted to try it, to let you guys know what I think of it while, uh, playing through it, and so far, it's, it's pretty decent, and, and people with depression out there, you know, that, that have been actually diagnosed with depression, you know, as opposed to some asshole like me who, you know, suspects but doesn't know for sure, um, you know, you know, let me know, you know, about how accurate all of this is that have been through this, let me know how accurate it is, um, because I'm only one perspective here, uh, but yeah, and again, um, I know you see a lot on, like, on Tumblr, on Twitter, on the social media, um, you can even Google it, if you really, if you're really having these issues and you, and you need help, uh, there are a whole shit ton of numbers out there you can call, um, so, you know, I, 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 I'll, I'll try and list them in the YouTube, uh, uh, description, if I remember to when I get this uploaded, uh, if not, uh, there's always Google, there's always, uh, Tumblr, and, you know, they go around rather regularly, um, so yeah, um, this game itself, it's not a bad game, uh, it's definitely different than what I'm used to playing, um, it's definitely different than a lot of different games, and, you know, when you take away all of the controversy surrounding, you know, you know, the lady who put the game together, you know, it's actually not a, not a horrible game, it's not horrible, um, it's very text heavy, and yeah, it's having no options or certain options bolded out or struck out for you is frustrating, but that, I think that's kind of the point, because, because even I, again, keep in mind, this, I'm, I'm an asshole who thinks he might have it, um, you know, even I understand, yeah, that is an option, logically that would be an option, but you, you know, your brain, your, your, your uh, emotions keep you from doing it, so that's kind of the point there. Um, I'll play a little bit more off screen because I kind of want to see where this goes. But I did say 30 minutes. I've went over my time. Anyway. <laughs> uh, so if you've watched to the end of this, thank you. Thank you very much for watching. Um, and seriously, if you're suffering from depression and you need to get help, then please go and get it. Please. Um, for, for the love of Mavericks, go get it. Um, so uh, until then, until the next time, this is Gomer, the Ranting Thespian, signing off.